I've known Anton Bosch for some years. I've known him from South Africa. He was formerly with the Coastal Assemblies, a Pentecostal denomination based chiefly in South Africa, which he left. Um, I'd like to address the questions as phrased, because people I know have contacted Moriel about his doctrine and about certain things he said, which he confirmed privately were about me, but he stated them publicly on a uh, video that is in the public domain. Okay, I'll respond to it because he put it in the public domain, but I don't want it to become a war or a personal rivalry or an ad hominem attack. I just want to deal with the doctrinal issues uh, and keep it doctrinal. Uh, let me first say that there is a problem in South Africa that is economic and political. The crime is out of control. The country is heading for an abyss. There are people who have tried to obtain clergy visas to come to the United States because it was easier than getting a green card to leave South Africa. Now, I don't blame anyone of any race for wanting to leave South Africa under the present conditions. The crime is literally out of control. But there are people who've left using the ministry as a ticket to the United States or as a way to circumvent the green card process. I don't believe Anton Bosch is one of them. I don't believe he's left South Africa for any kind of motive like that. I don't think he left because he was fleeing the crime or the political crisis or the economic collapse of South Africa that's, that's on the horizon. I don't think that's why he came to the United States. I don't think he's personally dishonest. I don't think he's in the ministry for money. I don't think he misused the ministry as a ticket or as an escape hatch out of South Africa in its present climate. I don't believe any of that's true of him. Secondly, he did publicly stand against a lot of what went wrong in popular Pentecostalism during the counterfeit revivals of Toronto and Pensacola. He has things to his credit, a number of things, and that makes me reluctant to want to attack him personally because I've seen him stand shoulder to shoulder with other people, Bill Randalls, myself, uh, a number of people in South Africa against the tide of these things. With Dave Royal, he's opposed these obvious seductions and counterfeit revivals. He went against the Pentecostal establishment in South Africa, led by Ray McCauley. Uh, he knows McCauley is a, a false teacher, among other things. It's hard to be critical of someone like Anton Bosch. He is not corrupt in the financial sense of the word. He is not somebody who was in Los Angeles pastoring a church because he was trying to escape the crime in South Africa. None of that is true of him. As far as I'm aware, he's always been honest. He's always exercised personal integrity in those respects. And uh, I don't think that should be questioned. Now, there are people who have done that. There are people who have used the ministry as an escape hatch out of South Africa. There are people who left South Africa because they were looking for a bigger platform to merchandise their hype, such as Rodney Howard Brown came to the United States from South Africa. There are people that have done those things, but Anton Bosch, I'd have to say, is not one of them. That is not his problem. He has some kind of criticism of myself saying that I'm intellectually unfit to be a Bible expositor because I supposedly don't know the difference between the words imminency and imminency, A-N-C-Y, as opposed to I-N-N-I-N, imminent, imminent. Well, I certainly know the difference. And he points to mistakes in, in one of my books or maybe more than one of my books, concerning the return of Jesus in this regard. And to him, this is some kind of prima facie evidence that I'm intellectually disqualified or uh, not qualified to be a Bible expositor. Uh, 
first of all, I'm the author of the books. I'm not the writer. The books are written by dictation. They're copy edited and proofread. Now, if there's a typographical error, a printer printer's error, an error in the copy editing, or an ed, uh, error of, of, of that sort, the proofreader missed something, that's not down to my error. I'm responsible for it as the author, ultimately. I have responsibility for it, but that does not mean it was my error. The problem is, where is the error? Let me begin by looking at the book on the rapture, the book Harpezo. In the preface of the book Harpezo, the Greek word for snatching away, it says the following. Among our pre-trib brethren, the doctrine of imminency, and I spelt it correctly, I-double-M-I-N-E-N-C-Y, is the belief that the return of Jesus can take place at any time before any other events of any prophetic significance transpire. That proves I know the difference between imminency and imminency, because they're, they're homonyms. Okay. In the book on the Antichrist, Shadows of the Beast, it gets complicated for the following reason. The terms imminency and eminency both come into play. Imminency means in and through. Jesus is imminent. He's in and through. It speaks of the divine presence in and through something. In the parousia, the return of Christ, the revelation of Christ, he's imminent. The Holy Spirit is imminent in restraining the power of Satan that is keeping the Antichrist from coming to power. Hence, there is A-N-C-Y, imminency, okay? But the return of Jesus <coughs> being imminent is another issue. I Reading from the great myth, and that Jesus can come tonight, I hold to imminency, A-N-C-Y. Paul wrote of our blessed hope, this is the parousia. Jesus will be imminent in the parousia. His presence will be in and through. It'll not be the way it is now through the Holy Spirit. It'll be direct, literal presence. It will be imminency. I'm also reading from Shadows of Roman numeral X, page 10. It's not uncommon for the adherence of such a doctrine as imminency. I-M-M-I-N-E-N-C-Y, -M -M -E I, -E I spelt it correctly, to equate it with the Pauline usage of the blessed hope. Now, Paul had the blessed hope, but he was not raptured. I believe that the blessed hope is the return of Jesus. The blessed hope is not in any sense dependent on the timing of the rapture. All believers throughout history all have the blessed hope. Believers a thousand, two thousand years ago had the blessed hope. The blessed hope is the parousia. It's the return of Jesus. It's the appearance of Christ when he will be imminent, imminency, A-N-C-Y. That is the blessed hope. Whether we meet the Lord in the air by resurrection or whether we are raptured, the dead in Christ rise first, both have the blessed hope. The blessed hope cannot be narrowly defined as the rapture only. They're taking it out of context. That is my view. He may disagree, but that is my view. But I didn't spell the words wrong. Now, I don't know... We have books on Kendall. We have books published in different countries by different printers. There can be typographical errors. There can be printer's errors. There can be mistakes in copy editing or oversights by a proofreader. Uh, okay, things like that happen, and they need to be corrected. But say that. Don't tell me that I'm intellectually disqualified from teaching God's word because I don't know the difference between imminency and imminency. I certainly do. I'll read it again. From Harpezo, our book on the rapture, among our pre-trib brethren, the doctrine of imminency, I-M-M-I-N-E-N-C-Y, is about the return of, of Christ and the belief that he can return at any time 
without any other events needing to transpire. I state directly that I know the difference. I don't know what his point is. It seems like he was just trying to grasp at something to say that I'm not qualified because he disagrees with me, so therefore he's trying to disqualify me on some very spurious grounds. That can be easily, easily shown to be wrong. He has certain views. One of his views is that there is some kind of, I describe it as a Pentecostal popery that was around from the beginning of, 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 of Pentecostalism. Now understand, Pentecostalism was like the modern charismatic movement that began in the 1960s. It was something that began right, but went off the rails. The difference is, among many Pentecostals, some people who had a biblical compass for where they were going threw grain into the toxic stew and straightened it out. They rejected people like William Branham and E.W. Kenyon and the heresies they were teaching. They rejected Amy Simple McPherson. They rejected these things. When Catherine Coleman ran off with another woman's husband from her worship team, they openly, openly deplored what she did. Uh, not all Pentecostals were crazy. Some of them developed a scriptural theology about what they believed and why they believed it. Now, these things began to change, unfortunately, certainly with the counterfeit revival at Pensacola. Most of mainstream Pentecostalism in the Western world, certainly the English-speaking world, began going off the rails in a major way. That is unfortunately true. But not all Pentecostals were like that. But there is this wrong idea in Pentecostalism of the laying on of hands, that things are transmitted this way. It is Anton Borges' belief that from generation to generation, there's a teaching ministry that is imparted or transferred through the laying on of hands, that you, 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 you need to have this or you, sh you should have this. And if someone does not have it, they're not actually the proper teacher or certainly not in any kind of leadership capacity a teacher. That is his belief. There is nothing in scripture that teaches this, nothing. It is Pentecostal popery. Paul spoke about Timothy, the laying on of hands that I might impart some gift to you, but doesn't specify what it was. Additionally, you have the problem of Exodus chapter 30. Uh, you cannot transfer an anointing and so forth. There is nothing that teaches this kind of succession. This is a Roman Catholic idea that the census plenier, the deep understanding of the scripture over the magisterium of the church came from Peter to the present Pope through this process of succession that's directed by the Holy Spirit. So the Pope ultimately has an infallibility. His word is the word of God to Catholics. He can write an encyclical, and when he speaks ex cathedra, it's considered infallible. Now, of course, Antoine Bosch has never said infallibility, but he has followed the same idea of a succession where only this person who's had the laying on of hands from the previous generation can have the census plenia, as a Catholic would call it. He doesn't call it that, but the proper understanding of Scripture. This thing is a Roman Catholic concept that's alien to Scripture. We do not see it. We do not see it. No place. In fact, we're kind of warned against people making such claims in certain passages of the New Testament, such as 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But it's not scriptural. Secondly, we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Anton Borsch teaches that women preachers, women teaching mixed congregations, uh, 
can happen as long as she's not exercising authority. If you are expounding scripture, that is a thing of spiritual authority. You're either doing it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit or you're doing it in the flesh. Now, I and Moriel as a ministry, we have no objection to women Bible teachers when they're teaching other women. Let the older women teach the younger ones. We have no problem with Sunday school teachers for, for children who are women. None. But for women to expound the scriptures to a mixed congregation, this is out of God's order. It is simply not scriptural. Again, going back to Amy Semple McPherson, you have a tradition of this in Pentecostalism that runs to the present day. You saw it in Catherine Coleman. Now, I'm not saying she was not a believer, but I am saying she ran off with another woman's husband. You see it today in people like Beth Moore, Cindy Jacobs, Joyce Meyer. Some of these women have a Jezebel spirit. It is a wrong thing when you have a woman preaching to men, to mixed congregations. There is a Jezebel spirit most likely at work. And when there's a Jezebel, there's an Ahab. Remember, when God uses a woman, when God uses a Deborah, there's a Barak, or a Yael, there's a Barak. When God uses an Esther, there's a Mordechai. Okay. When God uses Priscilla, there is her husband, Yune. Whenever God uses a woman, her head is covered. But nowhere do we see women in Scripture preaching to mixed congregations. Now, again, I don't have a problem with a woman giving her testimony. I have no problem with women teaching other women, sharing a prophetic message. If the Lord gives her that, providing her head is covered, that is under the protective male authority of her husband and the male leadership of the church, or a Christian father if she's single, or older brother if she's single. I don't believe in the suppression of women like the closed brethren, where they can't talk in the, in the church. I think that is a misreading of the scriptures. But leadership is male, and expounding the scriptures is leadership. There is no New Testament basis for women preaching except to other women. Now, again, my wife, although she's a mathematician by profession, my wife also has a degree in Biblical Hebrew, Aramaic. I'd have no problem with my wife explaining the technical grammatical nuances of an ancient Hebrew or ancient Aramaic text. I'd have no problem as a purely academic exercise. But if my wife is going to speak, she's going to speak to women in terms of teaching. She's not going to teach men. Explain the Hebrew, no problem. Share a testimony, no problem. Word from the Lord, no problem. But teaching doctrine, big problem. Women teach women. Husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His teaching is completely out of order. It is just not scriptural. It has wrecked havoc within the Pentecostalism from which he comes, and it's wrecking havoc today. Again, Joyce Meyer, Cindy Jacobs, and such people. It should not happen. Now, I'm not saying all women are like Joyce Meyer and Beth Moore. They're not. I recently watched a video clip of a woman called Heidi Baker. It was disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. When you see women teaching mixed congregations, you're going to see trouble. You're going to see doctrinal error. You're going to see spiritual seduction because she's out of God's order and her head is not properly covered. Anton is wrong. Women cannot expound doctrine to mixed congregations. Share the gospel? Share a testimony? Absolutely! Prophecy? Interpretation of a tongue? Absolutely, if done in order. But what he's saying, though, absolutely not. 
I just cannot agree with him. With respect, he's wrong. We've warned for some time that the feminism of the world is infiltrating the church and the Jezebel spirit is running wild today. Running wild today. Again, the conspicuous examples of Beth Moore, of, of Heidi Baker, of um, Joyce Meyer, and, and people like this, and Cindy Jacobs, certainly. This is a disgrace. It's, it's like Jan Crouch. It's women who are out of control. These are just women who are out of control. Their heads are not properly covered. However, although I disagree with him on this, this is not the main problem. Pentecostal succession of this kind of a teaching dynasty, it's not scriptural. Women preachers, not scriptural. The main problem, however, is this. Eternal or eternally begotten. Eternal or eternally begotten, authored by Anton Bosch. Some people very disturbed and upset in the United States have sent us this. I've read it twice. Anton Bosch denies the eternal sonship of Jesus pre-existent as, as the monogenes, as the begotten. He sees monogenes simply as unique, which it is, but not as eternally proceeding forth. When you say this, that Jesus was not the Son of God in eternity before the Incarnation, this is known as adoptionism. Adoptionism. There are two basic forms of adoptionism, variations of those forms, but two basic forms. In the early church, we're talking second and third century, you had adoptionists, and you also had other people, Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah but denied his deity, called Ebionites, they held to an adoptionism. So there were variations of ancient adoptionism. Ancient adoptionism is non-Trinitarian. It denies one God in three persons. The theological term for it is dynamic monarchianism, dynamic monarchianism. They deny the sonship of Jesus in eternity, that is pre-incarnation, but say he became the son of God, either at the incarnation or at his baptism, or some even at his resurrection, but usually it's either baptismal or incarnational. These are the adoptionists of the ancient world. They were non-Trinitarian. Then you have Trinitarian adoptionism that do believe in the deity of Christ and one God and three eternally existing persons. They do not deny one God and three persons. This is medieval adoptionism, medieval adoptionism. There were three primary variations of medieval adoptionism. The first came from the 8th century, of all places, Toledo in Spain, and its proponent was somebody called Elipados, Elipados, and he had various followers among the clergy. He was an adoptionist who did not deny the Trinity, but he said Jesus was not the eternal son, he was not the son in any pre-existent sense, he became the son. Okay. This is the kind of adoptionism that Anton Bosch appears to advocate. Anton does not deny the deity of Christ. He does not deny the pre-existence of Christ. He does not deny that Christ was always God. What he does deny is that he was always the Son of God. Now, another variation happened later. When it began in Toledo, with Elipedus, 
it came out of mystical monasticism, same as the emergent church today. That's its origin. The whole contemplative prayer, the labyrinth thing, the creation of mystical environment with candles, incense, icons. You see this robustly in the Eastern Orthodox tradition and the Byzantine church tradition. This is something that the emergent church draws on. This mysticism, experiential type Christianity. Uh, today we call it the emergent church, but it's not new. It was mystical monasticism. That is what Elipados came from, 8th century. This is the dark ages now, and things got really dark in Europe. The Roman Empire fragmented between the West, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Byzantine Empire in the East now, the Latin and the Greek. Okay. The West went into the Dark Ages under the medieval papacy. It came out of it after the Crusades. Islam had its golden age and the Byzantine Empire existed. So the learning of Islam and the culture and language of the Greek Byzantine church was brought by the Crusades into Western Europe. That planted the seeds for the Renaissance, a rebirth of Greco-Roman learning. Now with it eventually would come Aristotelianism. I'll speak about that briefly in a moment. Related but different subject. In any event, before this happens, we're talking now 12th century. There was somebody called Peter Abelard. Peter Abelard in, in the West, Peter Abelard believed in a Trinitarian adoptionism, that Jesus became the son. He was not eternally generated as the son. He became the son on earth when he came in human form. Push ahead. The early Renaissance is approaching. At this point, Aristotelianism coming from the Islamic world, at that time, Islam was not based by in Saudi Arabia and controlled by the Wahhab, funded by oil uh, of, of, of the Salafist clergy. It came from mainly Cairo, Egypt, uh, El Azra University still being there. It was a very westernized philosophical Islam. It was not the fundamentalist Islam you see today. At that time, the Crusades, the Catholics were the barbarians. They were the suicide bombers, sending children in human wave attacks, much like radical Islam does today, using children in the West Bank as suicide bombers and things of this nature. I've seen it. Well, the Roman Catholic Church did the same thing under St. Bernard during the Children's Crusades. It was the Catholics who were the barbarians. The Muslims under Salah ad were relatively civilized. Islam had a golden age in architecture, in science, medicine, mathematics, uh, certainly architecture. These influences come into Europe at the time of Thomas Aquinas. But a contemporary of Thomas Aquinas, broadly speaking, was somebody called Duns Scotus. Duns Scotus. Duns Scotus is most noted as the pri first primary exponent of the Immaculate Conception, the idea that Mary was conceived without sin, a sinless Mary. This was Duns Scotus. Scotus also had a variation of Peter Abelard's adoptionism, that Jesus became the Son of God when he was on earth as a human. He was not the Son of God in eternity. Anton begins arguing for this by examining the patristic literature and history of the Church Fathers and the creeds of the cradles of the Church. This is his first mistake, and it's a mistake others have made. The Athanasian Creed and the Nicene Creed say true things. The quest at that time was to explain to the Greco-Roman world in terms of Greek philosophy 
what the scriptures, the Judeo scripture, Christian scriptures meant and taught, and to put it into Greek terms. Unfortunately, the church became Platonized. Instead of recontextualizing the message, they redefined it and the church became Platonized. By the time adoptionism got going, you know, later on in the 13th century under Dun Scotus, the church had been Aristotelianized. It was part of a movement called scholasticism that was going on at that particular time. That's where these things gained momentum. Now, you have to understand from the church fathers all the way to the Renaissance, theology was not theology per se. Theology was philosophy. Not until Erasmus of Rotterdam published the Greek New Testament, taking four earlier Byzantine manuscripts and fusing them together into what we today call the Textus Receptus, was there a strong interest in studying the scriptures in the original Greek. This was known as humanism, not the secular humanism we see today, but a kind of Christianized humanism. This fueled the Reformation and set the stage for Luther and Zwingli and so forth. Luther learned from a French humanist, Le Favure, that the word metanoia didn't mean penance as in the Roman Catholic sacrament, but it meant to repent. People went back to the original Greek. All of these centuries, all the way up until the Renaissance, the scripture was the Vulgate, Jerome's Vulgate in Latin. People like Wycliffe tried to put it into English for the common people, but his followers were unbelievably persecuted by the established church in England. Uh, there were people who tried to hold to the truth but basically, it was centuries and centuries of philosophical debate. There were things called the Jansenist schism. There was the fight between those who Platonized the church with those who Aristotelianized it, and there was conflict. There was rivalry between religious orders. The Dominicans hated the Franciscans and vice versa. It went on and on and on. It was a dark time went on for centuries. One of the things that emerged twice during these dark ages was medieval adoption. Holding to the Trinity, but denying the eternal sonship of Christ. Now, I'm sorry it's so historically complicated, but this is the milieu that what Anton Bosch believes came from. He begins pointing out that the term eternal generation was first used by Oregon. And he points out correct things about Oregon. He quotes Will Durant, and Durant was right. It became evident that Oregon was a Stoic, a Neo-Pythagorean, a Platonist, and a Gnostic. He's absolutely correct. It was worse than that. Oregon emasculated himself. Oregon believed in eternal reconciliation, that Satan would ultimately be saved. Oregon spiritualized text out of context and assigned a spiritual meaning. He followed in the Alexandrian tradition that went back all the way to Philo. And that was something that found its apex with Basilides and Valentinus, with Clement of Alexandria. He was a part of this mysticism, this Gnosticism that had origins in Babylon. Alexandria was where East met West. Buddhist monks came from as far away as India to Alexandria at this time. It was quite a thing. Everything he says about Oregon is true. But because Oregon says something, that does not mean it's false. The Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult but they say some true things. No, the term eternal generation is not in the scripture, but the concept is. Same as the term millennium is not in the scripture, but the concept is. But the Jehovah's Witnesses always talk about the millennium. Peter tells us this is how false teaching and false teachers work. Para sogzusin 
in 2 Peter chapter 2, they put truth next to error. Because someone who's a false teacher says something, that does not mean everything they say is false. It means they say true things in order to camouflage what is false. They pronounce dogmatically truths in order to masquerade the deadly error. That's what Peter said they do. Oregon said true things in order to masquerade and camouflage his error like any other false teacher, as Peter warns. Anton does not appear to grasp this, at least as I've read his paper. Maybe he does, but he doesn't say so or give any indication of it in his paper, and he should have. He just discredits Oregon. Oregon doesn't need discrediting. But the question is not what Oregon said. The question is, what does the Word of God say? He also takes aim at the credos, the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed. Now, the things in these creeds are in principle true, but they're patristic. They come from the church fathers. They're not a basis of doctrine. They're patristic. They're not apostolic. The Apostles' Creed, however, is. It was called the line of faith. Before there was wide circulation of the New Testament manuscripts, which were all fragmented, it was not yet an organized codex, it was just becoming that, Christians knew the line of faith. Arguably, a document called the Didache is based on the line of faith, but so is the Apostles' Creed, the essence of what the Apostles taught. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. This is apostolic. It is not patristic. It comes from the apostles' teaching, not from the teaching of the church fathers. Here is Anton's first problem. He rightly points out that there were two church councils condemning Oregon. He's correct. But those same councils... produce documents that he seems to dislike. Additionally, there were two councils against adoptionism. Two. The first convened by Pope Victor against Elipados. Then there was a later one. These arguments are not well constructed. He doesn't begin where he should with the scripture. This is the essence of Anton's problem. Very poor exegesis. An understanding of monogenes, meaning simply unique, not eternally begotten. Well, we could put it differently. The issue is not eternal generation per se, but better phrased, eternal sonship. Was Jesus the Son of God before the Incarnation? Was he? And so there are passages addressing the Sonship of Christ that people can interpret and do interpret other ways. For instance, in Psalm chapter 2, we read about kissing the Son. He said to me, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. Uh, ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And so it goes on, verse 12, do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. Now, there are those adoptionists who say, well, this is true, but it is a prophecy. It didn't happen at the time the text was inspired to be written. He was not the son then. It's speaking of a future prophetic event about the son. Much like Psalm 22, dogs surround me. They pierce my hands and feet. They gamble for my raiment, cast lots. It's a prophecy like the other prophecies in the book of Psalms about, about Jesus. So although it's true, do homage to the son, it's something prophetic. It was not something preexistent in the sense of 
eternity before he was born. Another, of course, is in the book of Proverbs chapter 30. We read this in Proverbs chapter 30. It asks, who's ascended into heaven, verse 4, and descended? Who's gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters of his garments? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. Now, Orthodox rabbis say, this is Hosea 11, verse 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, Matthew 2.15 tells us, in that context, it is a Pesher interpretation. Yes, it's calling Israel God's son, but the Pesher, the Pesher is a simple meaning, it's Israel, but the Pesher is Christ. Israel is a figure of Christ. The rabbis reject this, of course. They reject the New Testament. They simply say it's about Israel. What is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. Yes, it's Israel. Now, I don't agree with them, obviously. As a believer, I interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. I do believe it. I don't agree with the rabbis. And I'm not saying that Anton Bosch agrees with the rabbis. I'm simply saying there are other ways to interpret this that people can and have engaged in. These sonship passages speaking of Jesus as the son of the Old Testament. However, when we go to Hebrews, it's another matter entirely. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions, and in many ways. Now, this was written to Jewish believers before the destruction of the second temple. This many portions and in many ways refers to the Perak HaShavuah, the annual lection, the reading of the law and the prophets, the Torah and the Haftorah in the temple and in the synagogues. We see Jesus following the Haftorah in Luke chapter 4 when he enters the synagogue in Nazareth. It's the portion of the week that was read liturgically by the Jews in the time of Jesus. Okay. Some from the Pentateuch, some from the prophets. But then it goes on to say, in these last days. Now this, of course, presents a problem. What we call the last days in popular Christian colloquial expression means we believe we're getting closer to the return of Jesus. That is not the New Testament term for the time period preceding the return of Jesus. The actual New Testament term for that is the close of the age. We're already in the last days. In these last days, we've been in the last days since the death and resurrection of Jesus on the day of Pentecost. Remember, the rapture and resurrection, as we've said before, have already begun. We're not waiting for the rapture or the resurrection. We're waiting for our role in it. The rapture began with the ascension of Christ. The resurrection began proliptically with the resurrection of Jesus. He's the first fruit from 1 Corinthians 15, 20. The rapture and resurrection have already commenced. We're already in the last days. What we call last days is better interpreted latter days as opposed to former days. We see this in passages such as Jeremiah 23. When we mean that Jesus is coming soon and we're seeing prophetic events heralding his return taking place more frequently and things of this nature, the term that the New Testament uses for that is better interpreted the close of the age, the close of the age. But I only mention this in passing. We have other teachings addressing it in depth. But let's look at the second. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. This is quite a situation. Let me bring up the Greek text. Ep eschaton ton hemeron 
totan eller läsen hemmen en vio hon en iken kleronomon Panton di ho kaitos anjes ages uh, epoisin Ep eschaton, on the last ones, ton, genitive, of, or of the days, hemeron, toton, these, were already in the last days in Greek, okay, that's also a genitive plural, okay, elelesin, from the word lalo, language, speak, glossolalia, that, this is aorist active third person singular. That's important. We'll come back to that. He speaks, okay. Hey man, to us. And we all in son. There's no possessive preposition in in the Greek. Translators interpolate that to make the text sound readable in English, okay. On whom, okay? That is a uh, preposition, active singular masculine. <coughs> he, can, he places. This is indicative aorist third person singular. Once again, at ekin, aorist, indicative aorist active third person singular. Okay. Now, what does that mean? It means past tense, but because it's active, it has ramifications for now. It's not just something he did, it's something he did that is ongoing. Something he did that is ongoing, it's active, but it's aorist, okay? Then it goes on. If he can, he appoints or places, uh, Cleronomon, like an like an occupant, an occupant of a place. Uh, this is accusative singular masculine, panton of all. This is just a genitive plural. The preposition through, who, whom, again, another preposition, only it's genitive singular masculine. So it's talking about the antecedent, who's the son. Kaitos enyas, to the ends of the ages, to the ages, uh, he makes a poison, which is also indicative mood, aorist, active, third person singular. Both verbs are aorist, active, third person singular. Well, who? The we all. Jesus had to be the son at the time of the creation. He was the son at the time of the creation. Find me a Greek scholar who will disagree with what I just told you about the Greek grammar. Find me one. You're not going to find them, but you can look. He was already the son at that time. Now remember, these doctrines of adoptionism gained momentum at a time when people were more concerned with the philosophy of Christianity than they were concerned with the theology of it. There was the Latin Vulgate. The Greek text only existed in the Byzantine Empire. The Muslims burned most of the manuscripts in the Middle East, probably nearly all of them. We know they did that at Alexandria and in Lebanon. You didn't have the same access to the scriptures that happened with the emergence of the Renaissance and of the humanism that engendered the Reformation intellectually. They didn't have this. So being ignorant of the original meaning of the text, adoptionism was able to find the market. People didn't know. Most people couldn't even read the Vulgate, even the clergy. There were mendicant orders of Roman Catholic priests who, could, who were almost illiterate in the Dark Ages. 
I called it dark for a reason. It was dark. It was bleak intellectually, among other things. It was not just bleak socioeconomically. It was bleak intellectually. Well, let's read once again. When you have both verbs, aorist, it happened. The antecedent noun is the sun, the wheel. Jesus was the sun at the time of the creation. That's what it says. That's what it means. This is unambiguous. Anton Bosch does not know what he's talking about in this respect. But let me go further. He tries to dismantle the argument of Proverbs 8, where the world was made through him, as John said, that wisdom is Christ. He dismisses this. He simply says, wisdom, chokhmah in Hebrew, in that context, speaks of the personification of wisdom. That's all. No, it does not. Now, we can never base doctrine on typology, allegory, symbolism, midrash. Those things indeed can help illuminate and illustrate scripture. But the basis of doctrine must be literal and direct. Text, context, cotext. Text, context, cotext. For Christians, the cotext is the New Testament. We interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Christ. <coughs> Matthew was written to believing Jews. Luke was written to non-Jews, the Gentile God-fearers, the proselytes, although Jewish believers read it. In Luke's synoptic citation, of Matthew 23, 34, Jesus says, I will send you prophets and scribes, and you'll kill them and persecute them. Let's look, for instance, at Luke's synoptic citation of this in Luke chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 49. For this reason also, the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute. Luke directly says that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. Text, context, cotext. We interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. In Proverbs 8, the master workman at the Father's right hand, creating the creation, was Jesus. He is the wisdom of God, says the New Testament. This is supported by multiple other passages, such as in 1 Corinthians and so forth. He's, he's the wisdom. The New Testament tells us he's the wisdom. It's not just a personification of the attribute. Anton Bosch then goes on to make a statement that would have gotten him laughed out of a room in any serious academic forum or theological symposium or any kind of a scholarly discussion. He would have been laughed out of the room. He says that wisdom is feminine. If it was talking about Jesus, it would have been masculine. He obviously does not know Hebrew or Greek very well, if he knows them at all. This would have gotten him left out of the room as a charlatan. In English, for instance, we have a neuter gender. In the third person neuter, you can refer to something colloquially in the feminine, and it won't be a grammatical error. A new ship, isn't she beautiful? Isn't she a beautiful ship? A new locomotive engine, isn't she beautiful? Trains can be referred to in the feminine. Ships can be. 
Uh, all kinds of things can be. But they're new to gender referred to in the feminine. Even in English, you have this. In Romance languages, you certainly have it. In Spanish, map is mapa. It should be feminine, la mapa, but it takes the masculine article, el mapa. But more so in Hebrew and Greek. The only person I've ever heard to attempt to use this ridiculous, and I'm sorry to be offensive, absurd argument by Anton Bosch. The man obviously does not have a clue what he's talking about, was the Roman Catholic apologist Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn tried to argue for Matthew 16, thou art Petros, and upon this Petra I'll build my church, that Peter is the Petra, but because he's a male, he had to be called the Petros. Oh, no, no. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Jesus is called the Petra, the feminine. <laughs> We can build on no other foundation. Jesus is the Petra. Peter is the Petros, the small stone, which is masculine, or the pebble. The boulder, the big rock, is the Petra, the feminine. Uh, in Hebrew, you've got the same kind of thing. Scott Hahn tried to use that argument to justify the papacy, the gender argument. It's absurd, because in Greek and in Hebrew, but we're talking, first of all, in Greek. Gender does not necessarily or very commonly mean sex. It means the way a verb or word is used in the context and construction of a sentence and its ramifications, its impact on other things. Gender is more complicated in language. Hebrew is the same. For instance, the Lord Jesus is referred to from the Hillel Rabbah in Psalm 118, Evan Rosh Pina, the building block that was rejected has become the cornerstone. Evan Rosh Pina, feminine. I have here a Passover plate for Pesach. To remember the Passover lamb on the plate, you have a shank bone. In the Haggadah, in the Paschal, in the Paschal liturgy, and in the Paschal meal, the Seder. It is called in Hebrew, Zro'ah. Zet, Resh, Vav, Ein. Zro'ah. Representing the Paschal lamb. It is feminine. Zro'ah. Who's the Paschal Lamb? Jesus. As the Catholics say, Agnus Dei Quitolus Pecatumundi. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, if you like the Vulgate. The Evan Rosh Pina. The building block that was rejected has become the cornerstone. Feminine. Hebrew. Gender does not have to mean sex. Let's go further with this. Isaiah 53. Let's read Ishayahu Nun Gimel. I will just read a bit of it in English, and I'll explain briefly what it says in Hebrew. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uzro'ah, the arm of the Lord. Same word. Zro'ah, same word. Feminine, the arm of the Lord that brings salvation. It's not the word yad, hand. It's the arm. Commemorated by a, a, a shank bone on the paschal plate. Feminine. Don't tell me. That in the Hebrew language, if it was talking about Jesus, it would have to be masculine. It can't be a feminine word. This is a display of ignorance that is laughable to anybody who knows the biblical languages. 
he doesn't know what he's talking about. Again, in an academic symposium with academic theologians and any kind of scholarly forum, he'd be laughed out of the room as a crackpot. I don't say that to offend. I say that because it's true. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Both verbs in Hebrews 1, 2, and I can give many other arguments. I'm just giving two. Our aorist, he was already the son at the time of creation. Additionally, masculine and feminine don't mean what they do in English. Even in English, in the third person neuter, you can refer to something in the feminine. You build a new sports car, isn't she a beaut? Or something like that. And it would not be grammatically incorrect or unacceptable. But in biblical languages, it's completely beyond that. It's the way the word is used in the construction. This is why the homosexual activists, the homosexual and lesbian activists, and the, the people who want same-sex marriage and so forth, the advocates of same-sex marriage, they use the term gender instead of sex. As a biological term, you've got X and Y chromosomes. We've explained this. A male is XY, a female is double X. You are male or female genetically, chromosomally. You're genetic male or genetic female. So they use the linguistic definition of gender because in language, male and female does not have to do necessarily with sex. Something masculine can be feminine and something feminine masculine, in certain cases even. But certainly something masculine is, is frequently called something feminine in both Greek and Hebrew. Frequently. It's more rare the other way. So they use a grammatical linguistic definition of male and female instead of a biological one because what they are chromosomally, they can't really become a male in a chromosomal sense. They can have themselves surgically resculpted to resemble a female or something like that, but they can't become one chromosomally, but they can do it linguistically by gender because in grammar, gender does not have to do necessarily with biological identity of male and female. Anton Bosch made a ridiculous, ignorant statement. He would be laughed at. Now, I don't want to revile or mock him, but he shouldn't say things like this. This is a man of deficient intellect. He can't properly exegete the Old Testament, the light of the new, which tells us Jesus is God's wisdom. He can't exegete Hebrews chapter 1. It tells us twice, Arist, that he was the son at the time of the creation. When it comes to exegesis, Anton Bosch is out of his league and over his head unless he sticks to very basic doctrine. I'm sorry to say this, but adoptionism is Christological heresy. To deny the eternal sonship of Jesus is heretical. He was the son at the time of creation before the creation, the world was made through him, and he is called the Son at that time. He's also the wisdom. The New Testament says so. It's not about symbolism or midrash or typology. It says it directly. Grammatical historical exegesis. Call it scientific if you want to. Again, before the Reformation, theology was called the queen of the sciences when people began to study the original languages again. 
John Collett in England, Le Fivure in France, obviously Erasmus, and so forth. It was seen as a science. Okay, let's take a scientific approach grammatically and historically. Doing so, Anton Bosch is debunked among theologians, he'd look like a fraud. He'd be laughed at. He doesn't understand gender. He doesn't understand the difference between gender and sex, or between sex and gender. He doesn't understand that we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. Jesus is our wisdom. We're told directly. He was already the son of God at the time of creation. He didn't become the son of God by adoption at some later point of his baptism or his incarnation or resurrection. He's the eternal son of God. Again, not because two church councils declared it to be heretical, though I say it's heretical. But understand where it came from. In its ancient form, it was held by Ebionites and adoptionists who denied the Trinity. In its medieval form, it came originally from mystical monasticism with Elipados and his followers, and then emerged again at the end of the Dark Ages, just on the dawn of the Renaissance, with Dun Scotus following the teachings of Peter Abelard in the 12th century. Again, Don Scotus argued for the Immaculate Conception of Mary. That, that's what these people did. These were people who only had access to the Latin Vulgate, if that. They didn't have the original languages. Their understanding of theology was wrapped up in Greek philosophy. The, the Platonic faction fighting the Aristotelian one. That was their thinking. That's when these things emerged out of a, not a vacuum, but a milieu of ignorance. And I'm sorry to say, as someone who believes in the gifts of the spirit, I am a continuationist. I do not believe in cessationism. I do not agree with people like John MacArthur, the notion that the gifts of the spirit, the charismatic gifts ended with the apostles is a false belief. I'm a continuationist. As opposed as I am to experiential theology, hyper-charismatic mysticism, Bill Johnson, Toronto, Pensacola, as opposed as I am to the counterfeit, I believe in the real. I don't like to be critical of other charismatics or Pentecostals, but most of them have gone off the rails. And with this nonsense, eternal or eternally begotten, yes, most Pentecostals have gone off the rails. By embracing this heresy, Anton Bosch is one of them. I say this without animosity. I appeal to him to correct his wrong doctrine. He's not the teacher he thinks he is. Laying on of hands by a previous generation of Pentecostals does not in any way imbue him with some kind of a spiritual authority as a teacher. No, women should not be teaching mixed congregations. Least of all, I know the difference between imminence and imminence. Read the books, it's documented. I didn't even write, I just dictated it. Look, statements were made publicly on a video. So I'm responding. People came to us from the United States and South Africa. So I'm responding. I'm not looking for a fight. I'm not looking for an ad hominem attack. But I would be more than honored to publicly debate Anton Bosch on front of a camera with the usual requirements 
there be one independent Greek scholar and one independent Hebrew scholar present. We will debate from the original texts. He's in Los Angeles. We can get a Greek professor and a Hebrew professor from Talbot Seminary or Biola and debate. My only requirement is that it be live streamed, that it be shown on the internet and that it be filmed and that the language experts be present. I will be more than happy to debate this issue. I'll be more than happy to debate Proverbs 8 in light of the New Testament and Hebrews chapter 1 in light of the Old Testament with Anton Bosch. I offer to debate stands. Now, if Anton wishes to graciously respond, I will be there. We can do it in Los Angeles at this convenience or the L.A. area, the uh, San Fernando Valley, wherever. Neutral venue, we'll do it at his convenience near his base. Be very gracious, very formal, properly moderated, no personal contention. But please, Anton, if you're going to respond, respond on the basis of exegetical presentation. Fact. Prove I was wrong or am wrong about Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong about the New Testament identifying Jesus as the wisdom of God, as per Proverbs 8. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. I'll debate you. I'll gladly debate you. But not with animosity. With a desire that the body of Christ will see the truth. Anton, Bosch, what you're teaching is nothing short of heretical. It is an ancient era. It is a medieval era. You are an adoptionist. It is not scriptural. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.